So yeah, we're a new um, Mixspace club that's hosted by Mixspace and BioMixspace members, which is myself. So I'm one of the organizers with Bamzi. And I just want to let you know before we start that the, this talk would be recorded so and then posted on YouTube. So if you don't want to appear, you can hide your cameras. And uh, yeah, we run uh, talks, social events, and even hands-on practical sessions every second and fourth Monday of the month. And uh, yeah, today we have Dr. Carlos and Part Information. And on the 19th April, actually, we have um, a talk on how cultural meat could uh, um, be leverage the innovations in the open science uh, biology community. So yeah, I'll let Dr. Carlos on Part Information introduce himself. Yeah, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. I think, I think you should, can you hear me well? Yep. Yeah, very good. I'm very happy that you are all here. You should all be at the pub, at least if you're in England, the pubs are open from today. So you should be commended for being here with me, uh, working out on patterns. So congratulations. Um, and yes, well, today I prepare a little session of, about patterns in biology or how do pattern science is related to the bio biological sciences, in particularly development, function, physiology, things like this. But also, I um, proposed uh, to carry out a little experiment from my kitchen, which is, um, well, to cook hexagons. Hexagons are patterns that appear in experiments of convection. And before, giving my little presentation and showing you uh, show you a lot of patterns all over the place. I thought it would be better if I start with the experiment, then we can rejoice if the experiment works. And if not, well, I don't go down in a low, we can just still see some other patterns and um, forget about my epic fail. So that's what we're gonna do, is that okay? So basically the experiment consists of the following. I wanna change camera to the setting that I have here in my kitchen. It's a hob. Um, and in this hob, I'm, I'm just gonna prepare, I'm just gonna put a viscous fluid, in this case, cooking oil, you can see it here, uh, with a bit of turmeric. The turmeric is to be used as a, as a dye, as a pigment, so, well, if the pattern effectively forms, we will be able to see the outline of the pattern. Now, a brief uh, introduction of these sort of patterns, uh, convection patterns is basically when you have a layer of fluid, which is viscous, and you put a source of heat at the bottom and the top of the fluid is uh, cold, what you have is uh, an induction of uh, convective currents that go from the bottom to the top, and then when they get cold, they go back to the bottom. So you get rolls. They roll from uh, the top to the bottom, and because of the symmetry of the recipient and um, the properties of the fluid, these patterns end up being hexagonal. If it's the ideal case scenario, if it's not perfectly flat or the convection is not very uniform, you would see a little bit of stripes, a little bit of um, anomalies. It would be very regular. Now, this is a very, very uh, easy experiment to carry out in the kitchen, but it is very dangerous because it involves hot oil. So the very first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna turn on, on the hob here. I'm gonna turn it on to a temperature of three. And I'm gonna let it, let it um, warm up a little bit. In the meantime, because I carry out this experiment with this very same oil and turmeric earlier, it has sedimented a little bit. So I'm gonna mix it a little bit. Uh, I'm gonna use a, a bit of a spoon. Let's hope I don't ruin it. So 
now that it's more or less uniform, I'm just gonna let this to boil a little bit more. And fingers crossed. Let's hope that you will be able to see the pattern as well because the camera is a little bit far, but I'm just gonna put it there. And let's hope for the best. If I see the pattern forming, I will try to put the camera closer if it doesn't translate well into the screen. So anyway, these sort of patterns were uh, discovered many, many, many years ago by Bertrand and by Raleigh and are a quintessential out of equilibrium system. Why is it out of equilibrium? Because you're pumping energy into it in order to maintain the pattern. Okay, here we go. It is heating and we can see, we can see it. Let's just give a little bit more time. You can tell me if you, if you see the contents of the pan. All right, if you don't, let me just put the camera in. Can you see? Uh, yes, there's uh, as a pattern of more or less a grid of dots, yeah. hexagonal grid. It is an hexagonal grid, exactly. This is a pattern that it aims to resemble um, coating in giraffes or leopards. Oh, I'm very happy that it worked very well. I'm just gonna turn off the heat before the oil starts to boil. You don't want to burn the oil. But well, there you go. That's a, the very first pattern that we're gonna see today, live from my kitchen. I am very happy. I shouldn't be congratulating myself, but I am gonna do so. What a joy. All right, now I need to change camera, but I cannot do that. This camera's not plugged in anymore, so it should just default. Okay, you need to plug it. It's got broken. Okay, here I'm back. Thanks. Well, that was a very quick experiment. I'm very happy that it worked out more or less okay. And thank you, Jenny. That's uh, Dr. Jenny Gibson here helping me. There's somebody in the chat. Yes, excellent. So now let me just share my screen and then we can talk more about patterns and patterns in biology. Okay, beautiful. Very good. So, um, here we go. the story starts with this little reaction, which is called the Velusov Sabotinsky reaction. This reaction was discovered in the Soviet Union at the late, the late 70s, I think. And it has a very, very interesting story behind it because it was published in one. Russian, obscure Russian journal or obscure to the West stating, oh, well, you know, uh, we can have a clock that is a chemical clock and we can create it in the lab and it's very simple and nobody believed it. So scientists in uh, the United States or Britain, but no, but this, this is baloney, this is impossible. We, they didn't believe these people. There are documentaries all over YouTube about this very uh, famous reaction. And well, eventually when people started to realize that this was actually happening or possible, that you could create reactions that would oscillate autocatalytic reactions without adding any external force, but just mixed, just catalyzing chemicals, people started to think, oh my God, this is exactly what we see in living matter. We see this in neurons, we see this in calcium oscillations in, uh, at the time it was interesting, people were interested in calcium in the, across the membranes in uh, human cells and the heart. And without further ado, I'm just gonna show you the, 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 the way this pattern actually works. It's a very long video, but I'm just gonna put the interesting bit when they uh, just steer the system 
they add some chemicals to it and you will see how it all of a sudden starts to um, change color. And then the color is gonna revert to the former um, color uh, pigment and so on and so forth. And you can actually keep this for a number of cycles without having to input more catalyzer. So that beautiful reaction started a massive, massive, massive trend in research in uh, nonlinear pattern formation. There you go, the basic reaction. Now, once people studied this and understood that you can actually generate these oscillations in chemicals, some smart person said, okay, um, let's just change the geometry of this. Let's just not use this giant vessel here. But let's uh, change the geometry and put it in a Petri dish. What, why in a Petri dish? Because it makes the thing very flat and the diffusion of the chemicals, it's only lateral or in plane. And what I'm sorry, is, yes. Dr. Carlos, there are two black squares on your presentation, on your screen. Oh, so it's, a, it's Zoom. Yes, thank <laughs> you. Okay, so let me just, are they gone now? Yeah, they're gone. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. So when people put this little reaction into a Petri dish, constraining the diffusion to a plane, they discovered this, right? Amazing. And then if you perturb the system a little bit, you get more uh, sources of uh, waves. And you can get all sorts of patterns if you change the geometry or if you add some other um, textures, uh, sorry, some other catalyzers to it, you can get very, very, very complicated patterns, right? So this then started to generate a revolution really in science because people were starting to ask, okay, there are other systems, systems in living systems in which we see waves. Do these waves behave in the same way? And if they do, what would be the um, consequence of this, right? For instance, one of the best known uh, systems in which this happens is the human heart and with calcium, intracellular calcium. So calcium, gets released and reabsorbed into the cytosol, into the surface or the intercellular space, and then generates a, a, a potential. This happens in a lot of cells. The difference with the human heart or with neurons is that these oscillations are driven by pacemaker cells, right? So you have an ex external stimuli is driving the system to behave uh, periodically. Here I'm showing you some myocytes in which the calcium wave is triggered in one end and then it, it diffuses all across the cell. Now you can stimulate the cell in several different places and you would get waves that travel in, across the cell in different directions. Now what happens when you don't look just only at one cell but in a, into a tissue and you start to play with um, the geometry of the system or the pace at which you stimulate the, the heart. Well, effectively, as, as with the venusov sabotinsky reaction, these are, uh, now I'm gonna show you tissue if above our cells, single myocytes, and these are tissues. And these are voltages, like if the calcium is ionized, it generates a, di um, a dipolar field that you can then measure as a voltage. That's a ECG basically. With these uh, measurements, people started to observe, oh, this is very strange. If the tissue is not homogeneous, you get re-entries. If the tissue is homogeneous, but the relationship between the natural period of the calcium cycling and the pace follows certain relationships, then you start to behave also in very strange ways. You start to get re-entry of the waves. You start to behave 
in what it is nowadays known as chaos. You start to develop period double bifurcations that end up to be chaotic. And the bad news is that uh, if you have an arrhythmia or you have tachycardia, or if you have any sort of ischemic uh, injury in your heart, this can develop. And when this develops, you just die in the most horrible, painful way. It is the, or the onset of um, a stroke. So then it became of primary importance to understand these uh, oscillations very well. So here we go. People started then to look into these equations under the light that was shed in simpler systems like the B set reaction, using all the universal behavior and robust patterns that those equations have to see if they observe the same robust dynamics in very, very detailed models of um, calcium cycling in, for instance, the human heart. This is a model of atrial cell with several compartments. You have pumps, exchangers, several um, ions, not only calcium, but sodium, potassium, you have, you name it, right? People have been able to measure the, in the impedances between uh, compartments, uh, dimensions, diffusion coefficients, and they realize that what regulates this intake, uptake uh, process of calcium induced and calcium release in the cell were these little guys that I, are called RIRYR2, is the ryanodine receptors. And when people started to look into these receptors, it turned out that they behave like clocks. This diagram here on the right is the cycling behavior of these uh, rhianodine receptors. And that tells you that, and they do depend to be opened on the calcium concentration present at a given time. So it's a feedback process in a way, calcium goes up, rhianodine receptor releases or intakes the calcium depending on the period of this guy. If this guy's period starts to be uh, messed up by a mutation, or as I said, by some ischemic injury, whatever, what you have is results such as, oh my God, I made a mistake. Let me just go back here. Uh, 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 uh. A behavior like this, you develop uh, OPS, one, two, one, two, one, two dynamics in the calcium concentration. And then you can characterize the period uh, bifurcation depending on the stimulation and the intrinsic recovery period of the clock and see what is gonna happen if you increase or decrease the stimulation period depending on the recovery time of the ryanodine receptors, right? One of these, okay, and that is very important. This is exactly what you see in the reaction that I showed you at the beginning. You are able to induce oscillations in a living system and to understand them, which is more important. Now, some other kinetics show this very same um, behavior. This is the famous Lorentz attractor. In this case, you have three chemicals that autocatalyze each other and inhibit each other. And in a given range of parameters for the rates of production and decay of the chemical, you get periodic behaviors very well defined. These periodic behaviors are, if when you plot one variable against the other, it means that you get closed orbits in the projection, such as in this diagram here, right? But then if you actually tweak a little bit the reaction rates, and this is where it gets very interesting, because if this actually represents a regulation network or a expression pattern of a given complex, then you would also develop these bifurcations that would lead into chaos. That is at the very core of uh, evolution and development, really, because if you have a complex system that is described by a gene regulatory network that is very well known, very robust, preserved across many different organisms, you can see that the effect of a mutation could be this. Right, because a mutation, what does in a regulation network is 
it changes the values of the enzymes production or removes or adds a link, an inhibition or an activation link. And this gave um, origin to studies into studies of circadian clocks or uh, other biological rhythms that are self-sustained. In this case, you're not inputting any energy into the system. You just add certain chemicals ab initio, and then the system starts to oscillate, right? So that is very cool. But then people started to think, OK, that is only a reaction. That is like just a tiny little point in the reactions that I showed you at the beginning. What happens when you do exactly the same as with the B set reaction? Put them in a flat space or in a tissue or in a cell and add diffusion. Well, it turned out that sometimes the system preserves their stability of the pattern and it only, the effect of diffusion is only to separate domains of up or down. But in some other cases, it gives you full chaos. I'm going to show you this pattern here. It's a reaction diffusion model. These are actually, they have a name. Diffusion-driven instabilities have a name that is very famous. They are called Turing patterns, right? Because Turing was the very first person that described uh, this sort of uh, effect of diffusion in chemical reactions. Let me just show you this. I start with a very homogeneous mixture of two chemicals. And in this case, what is going to happen is that they are going to segregate into droplets. This system is more or less describes um, water and oil. It will take some time to stabilize. It is still evolving. We cannot see it very much, but it's still evolving. But eventually, we'll reach a stationary state, which is uh, very few droplets embedded into uh, an, a, a, another media. I think. From here and on, we're not going to see any further change, I think. No, I don't think. Yeah, we we'll stay there. It remains stable. Whereas in this case, this is a very similar set of equations than before. I start again with a very, very homogeneous mixture of components. But what happens is that they locally stabilize but the diffusion is not strong enough to homogenize the mixture, and then you end up with this labyrinth. These sort of systems are very, very commonly used to describe zebra fish patterns or fingertips, like you know, prints in your fingers. The, the formation in some other surfaces, it's um, a system that it's out of equilibrium. It, it remains operating, but it, they both reach a stationary configuration that is going to remain there for the rest of time, right? Now I'm going to show you another set of patterns. These are mechanical patterns. Then again, they, they show many similarities, at least mathematically and structurally, to what I showed you before. But they are embedded in, they're, they're imprinted in the surface of certain flowers. Why are this important? This is actually amazing because these patterns are ridges that form on the surface of cells. And because they are uh, nano ridges, so they are very, very small, they interact with light as diffraction ratings. The effect of that is that you will see the flower as an iridescent surface, like a CD, depending on the angle that you see, you will have one color or another, and then, that turned out to be a cue for pollinators. So it's an evolutionary trait to allow certain flowers to attract with pollinators. I'm showing you here the tissue of these flowers early in the development. And when they grow a little bit more, the petal develops a little bit more. You start to see that the patches start to emerge of these ridges. And then the full domain, once the petal is fully grown, fully developed, they get like super, super striated. I, I have here a photo, a microgram of uh, the onset of the striation. And we have another microgram of the fully striated pattern. And then again, can we describe this? It turns out that we can, if we do some mechanics, here's a, a cross section of this same picture. 
before and after. How do we go from here to here? Well, in this case, the key is growth. And it's a tropic growth. And the um, difference in the material properties between the upper layer and the substrate. That determines when a surface such as this is going to striate. And not only that, it tells you also when it's not going to striate. If the cuticle is not inhomogeneous enough, you don't striate. If you grow, but you don't grow enough, you don't overproduce cuticle or cutin, you don't striate. So if you can actually then determine the dynamics of cutin production in a species that develops its ridges, then you can tinker with it. Like this is like very synthetic biology in a way. And then plug in a cassette or something and create flowers that have the appearance that you like, but do not destroy it, or vice versa. I want to show you some simulations of these solving Newton's equations in slabs to uh, describe these sort of patterns. I'm going to show you a, a, the development in a flat surface and in a curved surface to, the, to, to simulate the turgor pressure that bends the little cuticle. And you can see that by expansion, by expansion of the cuticle, you can get these striations. Not only that, if you keep growing at the same time, the thickness of the film at the top of the petal, then you can regulate the wavelength of this pattern. By the way, in this case, you can see that at some critical point, you start to develop also period double bifurcations, but now we are in space. So these two little rabbit ears start to be paired rather than to behave as a single homogeneous pattern with a single, single period. Let me just show you the same as this before, but like a close up. You can see how the film growth induces the, um, the striation of the tissue. It's quite fascinating. Then again, this is not a chemical system, but the mechanisms, at least uh, from a metaphysical point of view, are the same. Symmetry breaking, geometric constraints, and of course, the underlying genetic machinery that overproduces one or another catalyst will induce these sort of patterns. I got like thousands of examples because this is what I've been doing for the last year. So perhaps I won't go too deep into it. I'll just show you the same principle applied to a three-dimensional chunk of cuticle. I am, these two are the same uh, simulation of um, mechanical growth, just seen from the top and the bottom. They are very uh, slow because at this stage I just took a very, very fine time step to appreciate the full um, effect of the striation formation. Let me just speed it up a little bit. You get this patterns, of, well, they resemble more or less what you see in these processes. You can do the same with curvature, actually. But the mechanics, so, so this starts, starts to become a little bit ornamental. You add a curvature, a turbo pressure, but the mechanism is very, very, very robust. So you develop the same pattern. And not only that, these are, again, like in the Turing instabilities that I showed you before, very robust. You a, stop at some point producing cutin, but the system is already in this state. And because there's no other force keeping the system like this, it becomes irreversible. So the pattern is going to remain there for the rest of the useful life of the petal, right? I'm just showing you here on the, the cross angle of the previous simulation so you can appreciate how these patterns develop. Okay, finally, I'm going to show you that, okay, you can study these patterns in uh, silico or theoretically or with experiments, as I just mentioned, by tinkering with the, um, with mutants of a given organism that you already know does one thing or another. But you can also build them like uh, electronically 
or um, mechanically. I want to show you, we built up like a long time ago with Jenny and uh, Marco Aita, we uh, started to carry out experiments of, again, trying to build up a gene expression, massive system that we could couple and study synchronization, period double bifurcations, et cetera, et cetera, but uh, electronically. And as you can see here, I'm just going to make this. Again, uh, you can have the oscillator. You can tune the rate of production of one or another vo uh, voltage. In this case, is the load of the capacitors in this circuit. And you can go from uh, a periodic pattern, very similar to what you see in several circuit systems, you start to tinker with it, you develop the bifurcations, you turn into a chaotic state, and then uh, you end up with your chaotic regime, very, very similar to what I showed you earlier. And this is realizing or constructing something that came out of a calculation. And this is actually very new. I have shown this before to some members of Makerspace, but not to everybody. This is again what they call a mechanical neuron. This is again an oscillator. It's basically a seesaw that has a counterweight here and you can regulate the flow of mass addition in this end of the seesaw and it will oscillate with a given period and that's fine. You need to reach a threshold to release your signal. but you have a very definite period, which is fine. We'll remain doing that for as long as there's water feeding it, right? Just like a neuron or like a, an action potential process in several systems. But what happens when you don't change any of the machinery, just tinker a little bit with the angle at which this guy releases water. Well, what happens, hopefully you will be able to appreciate this because it's a very deficient video, but it gives the gist. You can also trigger the period double bifurcation here. So, uh, okay, this picture I put, you know, only if in case the uh, hexagon experiment didn't work, but that's all I have to say for today. By the way, I just want to say something. I would like to, we are always looking for people and like-minded um, enthusiasts to build more toys that describe um, mechanical or electronic versions of systems that we see in uh, nature. So if you're up for it, Let's get in touch and we can play with all these toys. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Callis, for this wonderful presentation and your beautiful experiment. Do you, does anyone have any questions for Dr. Callis? Don't be shy. <laughs> Oh, where do I see the questions? No questions. I was wondering, is um is chaos, is it generally something that's unwanted in, in nature or does it have a use? Well, um, excellent question. Chaos is um, in a way defined as the lack of order. So, uh, Every time you have a behavior that is not periodic, but quasi-periodic, it is perhaps closer to chaos than to order. Now, in celestial mechanics, in mechanics in general, mechanical systems like oscillators, like springs, pendulums, in, in um, fluid dynamics, chaos, turbulence, it is more the rule than the exception. If you want to understand like, like equations like Navier-Stokes equations that describe the flow of fluids or um, the noise in junctures in certain circuits, 
the motion of planets, the free body problem, those systems are by definition highly nonlinear and chaotic. So uh, I wouldn't, I, I, I don't want to get myself into, they, this is being recorded, right? I have a reputation. So what I can say is you can find system in which, systems in which chaos is more regular than order. Now, in the case of living systems, order seems to be the rule because that is what keeps things repeating themselves, like the circadian rhythm, like the oscillations in calcium in the human heart or in neurons. You don't want chaotic behavior to occur. For instance, one of the um, examples that I showed you was what happens when you start to oscillate chaotically in the heart when you die. Another very good example, it's not chaos, but it is related, is synchronization. When you have many oscillators, all oscillating at a frequency that is very close, they enter in synchrony, right? So you are uh, all synchronized and then they all start to oscillate at unison. And if that system is, for instance, your brain, you're gonna end up having a seizure so what you want there is mechanism that guarantee that these synchronizations do not percolate across the entire system, but remain constrained and modularized. So in that respect, uh, disorder is a good thing. That's all I can say. Yeah, it's interesting. So it does have some, some uses. Is it the same for the muscle cells? Like, would you not want them to all beat in the same uh, oscillation? Should they be more disordered if you want to grow more muscle? <laughs> well, that I don't know. Sometimes when um, in growth processes, tissue growth processes, what you want is synchrony. So you don't develop uh, atrophies or uh, chimeras or, you know, organelles that are tumors, whatever you, you have a, Synchronic mm. behavior, and you, you elongate more naturally without developing any deformity, I suppose. But yeah. um, there are many, many cases in which uh, disorder is preferred than order. And growth processes is probably not one of those cases because you want to tightly regulate the organism that you are developing without killing uh, the plant or the hypocotyl or whatever it is that is growing. One of the things that happens very often when with the people I work in plant sciences is they do develop mutants. And these mutants, precisely because they do not have the tight machinery that increases certain bit, an elongation factor or um, a complex in the, in the circadian clock, very well regulated, they die. They die very easily. They are not robust. They are not produce, able to produce lines or they do um, not flower, etc. So it is actually probably the consequence of all that I said, it's just like obviously a very broad picture of what people actually do all over the world in this sort of research is that we are going to have work for a long time because we are only scraping the tip of the iceberg into what is actually going on and the translation from genotype to phenotype like okay you have your sequences they express they get annotated but then you want to put them in regulation circuits in metabolic networks in complex to see what's robust what is not essential Maybe now that we have uh, artificial intelligence that can make a lot of very good inferences, we can just train the neural networks to identify a lot of patterns in many systems and wait for a number of years and come back and ask, so what's the answer? And it's going to tell us 47 or something. We don't know. But there's a lot of work to be done there. 42. 42. 47, my God, what I was thinking, my age.
<laughs> but that's all right. Yeah. Any more questions? If not, I Carlos, I have one, one, one last question there. Um, you mentioned about studying various patterns in um, nature and how different biological organisms or, or, or chemical processes leads to these patterns. Um, but could you give some examples um, of somewhere you can reverse engineer this, whereas to have a pattern and design a biological functioning system? Did you come across any of that such? Oh, yeah, 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 definitely. Um... Well, I think it has happened before. It has happened with, um, and it's actually been actively, actually it has been discussed sometimes in um, biology club or in makerspace or biomakerspace. The fact that you can train cells to do what you want, providing them um, a grid or a, let's, let's say like a way, so where they can move around. And then people can engineer cells to do one or another sort of uh, motility. I'm talking about motility here, Cell, mammal cells, to move in one way or another. And um, actually, people do these things in order to uh, grow artificial skin or to improve um, heal, to heal, you know, healing wound healing and things like this. There's work done in these in these directions where if you understand the behavior that you aim, you can actually try to induce that behavior into us. And that's that's also what plant scientists do a lot of the time with their CRISPR cassettes and things like this. They, they are able to induce certain behavior that's have been done for a long time to change, for instance, the color of a, of a flower or things like this. But of course, to train a living organism to do something that you want or to reverse engineer it, it has a scope. It all depends on the scope of what you want to achieve really. But that's pretty much what people do all the time with in synthetic biology and with, with mutants and things like this, yes. Or maybe not. I, I forgot you're recording this, and it could be available. It could be available later. So maybe yes, maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Anything else? If not, I think I my internet glitched earlier, but I was asking, um, what's the next thing that you'd really like to build? The next thing that I'd really like to do. To build in terms of the toys and stuff. Oh yeah, well, there's a number of uh, so there's a number of um, things that we can do. One of the things that I had I was working a few months ago, like actually at the beginning of the pandemic, but then everything turned into chaos. Was I, I am trying to build um, with Marco? I don't know if Marco is here today. Uh, a circadian clock, like a self-sustained system that actually takes information from the environment. In this case, that would be a light and temperature and translate that into an oscillating system that do something, but it's periodic, it's self-sustained. And then to be able to tweak with a parameter or two, terms of a, a resistor or voltage uh, to modulate the period of that circadian oscillator. We wanted to build like in a way like an electric circadian clock, electronic circadian clock, but, uh, and it's not that difficult, but it involves coupling several oscillators, it involves coupling, um, something that actually translates into a phenotype, could be a color screen, could be um, applying some tension to some filament so you can uh, move in one direction or another. 
there's many, many things that can be done that are now I have to say that all the stuff that I do, you can ask Jenny this, they are all for fun. I wish I could publish more all this stuff, but I, I end up always doing this for fun and to know, to know, because I think it's important just to know. There's no reason for why do, would I like to do that, just to know or to test. Actually, it re relates to the previous question or to reverse engineer some behavior. I don't know. We did a lot of um, experiments on fly traps before because I thought we could harness their action potentials to act as neurons and to see if we could like synchronize them. Now, these breaks are really good fun, but they take a lot of time and, and they take long, uh, so they, they need commitment. One of the things that we have done or experienced in the past is that we start with momentum, but then as time passes, we start to lose members in the team because people have other things to do. And because these things not necessarily advance very fast, uh, they get abandoned. But if you are interested, just like uh, drop me a line and we can discuss more things to do, more fun things. If you have ideas, I'm also very willing to do to do things. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. I cannot listen to anybody. Hello. Hello, we can hear you. I'm just trying to find the video. I was at, I was in Italy last year and there was a really cool, not, not two years ago, last year basically didn't happen. Um, <laughs> uh, there's a really nice video of some um, patterns, but I forgot, they did something extra on top of the ordinary, um, uh, the ordinary kind of autocatalytic ones. And I'm just trying to find the video because it was really cool, um, but I'm struggling. <laughs> I might post it in biology club if I can't find it. Well, you can post it in the channel. Okay, then if there are no more questions, uh, Dr. Carlos, could you please uh, stop sharing and I'll just share one slide. As uh, Jenny was saying, if you want to keep up to date, you should follow us in our Google, um, Google group. And also, if you want to help us organize, because we're a recent group, and uh, yeah, we'll really appreciate if you have any feedback and what sessions you would like to see in the future. So this is where you can find us. And um, yeah, just a reminder, um, the session is recorded, and we'll see you uh, actually uh, next week uh, for a session on coaching. So yeah, thank you everyone so much for coming. I hope you have a good evening.